Open your Bible with me this morning, if you will, to Revelation chapter 16. We continue our study in Revelation. Uh, this passage of scripture we're uh, going to look at uh, is the last of God's judgment, bringing everything down to the end for Armageddon. You hear uh, on the news sometimes they talk about Armageddon. Uh, we're about to enter into Armageddon. Well, if you will listen to what uh, John wrote in uh, Revelation 16, then you will see that we're not in Armageddon or even yet uh, right at Armageddon. It will come at the end of the, tri of the seven year tribulation period. The church will have been raptured and all kinds of things, bad things, are going to take place on the planet Earth. Uh, we will, as Christians, will be in the presence of Almighty God in heaven, uh, watching and waiting for the return with Christ to the earth as he will have that final battle and set up the millennial uh, kingdom. One thousand years of reign on the planet Earth where it will be nothing but peace, as we will find out later from scripture and teaching here, Satan will have been uh, bound and put into a hole for the thousand year period, so with him out of the way, there will be no problem with uh, sin, even though men will live on the planet Earth during that time, uh, during that whole period of time, there will be just a continuation somewhat like it is here now with uh, babies born and families and so forth. Uh, at the end of that, when man has lived in this peaceful time, uh, they will still turn against God, as you will see in the end of the study. Uh, we've talked about the other plagues or the other judgments of God. Uh, the, the way that he broke the seven seals in, in between the sixth and seventh seal, there was a, a pause between the two. Of, we call it a parenthetical part of it where he shows that he's still a merciful God even though there's a judgment going on on earth. Uh, he's pulled back himself away and let Satan loose to do whatever he wants to do. Let man have his way. Uh, man wants to have his way, God says, okay, have your way and see what happens. And it will not be good. Uh, then the seven trumpets, uh, we looked at that too, the sixth, at the end of the sixth trumpet, there was another, another parenthetical uh, part there where it again shows the mercy of God, uh, a little pause between the sixth and seventh trumpets of God's uh, uh, wrath. As I was listening to a man the other day, he said, that's not God's wrath, that's Satan's wrath. Well, let me tell you this, it's God's wrath in that he lets Satan do all these things uh, during that period of time. Uh, this part here is dealing certainly with the last three and a half years of the seven-year period. Uh, if you've been taught, uh, you know, there are those that believe in pre-trib, meaning the rapture of the church before that seven years. There are those that are taught uh, mid-trib, meaning that the first three and a half years the church will be here and then raptured and then the last three and a half. And then there are those that's called post-trib that believe that we'll go through the tribulation period. We believe in pre-trib in this church and we believe because he said he would deliver us from the wrath to come. And uh, I don't see anything good on planet Earth for a seven-year period. And we know that things are being put in place. The Jews already have all the things that they will need to build the temple. As I was watching uh, on, I think, 58, I don't remember the channel now, but as a preacher, they were showing the Eastern Gate. And... Uh, the, you know, the wall there, the gate's been sealed up, and Jesus said he would, he would come through the eastern gate. 
they, the Arabs uh, put a uh, cemetery there because Jesus is not allowed to go to the cemetery. It's kind of funny to me because it's like that. He, he, they're going to keep him going through the eastern gate. They know that's what he said. And all those uh, bodies will not be there to hinder him to go through a cemetery. But that's a, that side of the eastern gate is the side of the temple, where the temple is in that area. So it won't be long. That will all be in place. The ten uh, nations, uh, the European Euro nations, they call them United States. Euro nations that uh, we used to call, they used to call them the common market. And uh, they're already in place. They've already agreed on uh, a lot of things. They currency, they were agreed, if you, if you were in Germany, you can drive across all those nations with your driver's license. They were agreed with a lot of things. The, the problem they have now is they're looking, and they're looking seriously, folks, for uh, one man to be in charge of all of those nations. That's what this is about. And that's what, uh, you know, it's called the man of sin. Uh, you know, he's uh, going to be the last uh, Gentile king on the earth. Uh, but he's, he, he's probably, we probably even know him. We don't know for sure, but we probably know him. He's probably on the scene over there somewhere, and he will be given a, uh, power to rule over all of the uh, nations then, over Jerusalem. He'll give Jerusalem the privilege to build the temple back. So all of this is getting in place. And uh, this part here in the 16th uh, chapter is showing you uh, how bad it's going to be at the very end when God is bringing everything in uh, order for the very last uh, battle, the ba when he will make the way for the kings of the east to come so there will be all in place around Megiddo Valley uh, to, uh, so they're supposed to be there to fight each other, but as uh, someone put it in this terms, it's the time they're there to have a battle with each other. They're going to see the Lord coming, they're going to all turn together and battle the Lord. And you're, you and I are going to get to see the awesome power of God when he defeats them with his, with his mouth. You know, as he said, we have uh, the false teachings of, uh, uh, you know, evolution that tries to deny that God uh, created. And yet the Bible says he spoke this into existence, he spoke that into existence, and on and on. And, and the only time when he didn't speak anything into existence is that he took what he uh, made by speaking it into existence and formed some uh, dust, dirt, <laughs> into the form of a really, probably the most handsome man that's ever lived on the planet, uh, made of God, made by God, he made Adam, and he's, he's laying there, he breathed into his nostril and gave him the breath of life, and uh, you know, it just seems like impossible, doesn't it? It's kind of like uh, Sadducees. Uh, I went to college to some Sadducees, and they said, if God can't raise anyone out of the grave, I said, do you believe he created the world? Yeah. <laughs> I said, you believe that he actually just spoke this planet into existence? Yeah. And you telling me this is a, de a debate after a speech that I, I gave on the gospel, really, and uh, they said, and I said, are you telling me that you believe that God is so powerful that he can speak all this into existence, but he doesn't have the power to raise uh, a body uh, from the grave and put life back in it? <laughs> there was no answer. That was the end of the conversation. Uh, folks, God is a powerful God. He's a loving God. He's a merciful God. He showed mercy up to this point, but his mercy ends. Uh, you've heard, uh, you might have heard your mother say, I've had enough. <laughs> you know, when you were, she was raising you, she said, okay, I've had enough. And she gives you a spanking or whatever and punishes you. Well, God's going to have enough. 
And the time is drawn, drawing very close to God saying, that's it, I'm going to take my people out and I'm going to turn it over to Satan and I'm going to let this thing all go and develop and you're going to see how good you had it by having the Holy Spirit on this planet Earth with you working through these churches. My friend, if you don't think the Lord's church is important, you need to think again. You need to read the Bible. You need to see how valuable he sees it. He saw it so valuable that he died for it. And so you and I need to see that it's really important to this planet Earth, to this Stephenville, Texas, that this church and all of God's churches are here honoring and worshiping God the way they are and witnessing to a world. Uh, when you look into this chapter, you're going to find the word great many, many times. He uses the word great, a great voice, great uh, heat, great river, a uh, great day, on and on that he uses the word great, a great earthquake. And he talks about that. Uh, we're looking in, starting in chapter 16, and I'm just going to go down verse by verse. And one, he said, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to uh, seven angels, uh, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. They had a position, and they knew what it was, seven of them, and they, whenever it's like, okay, it's time for you to go get in position. It's a, somewhat like a, uh, maybe a, a band or uh, maybe the stingerettes. They know where they're to go for their, to carry out what they're, they've been taught to carry out. And so God is saying to these angels, go take your position, take the, bio, uh, the bowls or vials, and you pour them out. And as each one would do it, it would be in succession upon the planet Earth, as, you, as you'll see. And pour out the, the vials of the wrath of God upon the Earth. And the first angel went and poured out his vial upon the, the Earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the uh, men which had the mark of the beast uh, and upon them which worship his image. So uh, uh, commands given and I don't think this was a voice like you and I would even be familiar with at all as we've ever heard but it's one as well uh, so all can hear what the orders are, are that are given. Uh, they, they, it's like the, the word voice here means it's like a megaphone okay it comes from a Greek word megphone or something like that and it's like you've, you've used, used a megaphone you know how those things can carry out the message that is to be carried out it was not a still small voice of God my friend as it was to Elijah when he's taking care of Elijah this is a voice that okay I've had enough go do what I've told you your job is to do and the first angel went, as it said, and uh, poured out uh, his vial upon the earth. There's, and it uses two words here, noisome and greasome, uh, uh, grievous sores fell upon men. The word noisome uh, here means uh, terribly, uh, it's a terrible uh, act of God that he's used to bring about these sores. And grievous means malignant. We don't know what the sores are. We know this is something that took place in four out of these seven, by the way, uh, the plagues that was poured out happened back in uh, Egypt when, uh, you know, the, ten, the plagues that God poured out, four of these, and this is one of them where men broke out with balls uh, all over them and uh, this happens here, though, that was just for the, the Egyptians uh, for refusing to let God's people go. This is a, all the man, mankind on earth that has taken the mark in the forehead or right hand of the beast or has worshipped his image, and it's God's judgment upon them that they will be uh, 
uh, just terribly uh, broken out with sores all over their bodies. And you'll see why in a moment. Uh, I, you know, I was talking to someone this week, past week, and I was talking about their, their, they, were, their, they were so meticulous about their baby that they bathed it every day, sometimes two or three times a day, to the point that it, <laughs> the doctors told you quit bathing this baby so much. And every time you do, you put some oil on, his, on her skin. And so, uh, you know, I guess you can be too clean. <laughs> But uh, they're not going to be able to be clean. Can you imagine being uh, in a place where you can't even, even sponge, take a sponge bath? I mean, you don't have any water. You're going to see in a moment, there's nothing to drink. There's nothing to take care of yourself bodily. And so they break out in these sores. They have nothing to help with these things, as the Bible says. So I'm glad, to, and I hope everyone in this congregation knows Jesus Christ as personal Savior because I'm telling you, this is not the place to be. And then it said, the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man and every, every living soul died in the sea. Uh, they have uh, what you call a red tide. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. But it kill, when those things come in, it actually kills all the sea life. And they, you know, it's recorded that they had this to happen around Florida one time, and all the sea life in that area of that red tide died. That was located in an area. Uh, we, you know, you wonder, maybe you think about the, the oil spill and how many maybe creatures died in that. When this takes place, the Bible's not talking about an isolated area here. It's talking about every living soul, everything that lives in the waters of the sea will die. What does that mean? Well, you know, when they had the oil spill and it began to, the oil began to float down the coast uh, from Pensacola, Florida, and then along that uh, shoreline down through there, uh, and I don't know what they've done to stop it if they have, but... That concerned all the businesses along that coastline because they depend on, especially, uh, uh, it's a big thing down there for the military and for college that they go to the shores and they let, a lot of money goes out right there. Also fishing, it, it was just a time of real concern that all along the Florida coast on that side was going to really suffer from loss in every way. Well, whenever this happens, it's not going to be any work. There's not going to be anything, to, any fish to eat. And we do depend a lot on the sea, more than you think, to have our food on our tables. And so, so no, it's not going to be that way because God's judgment's being poured out and the sea's going to turn as blood of, of a dead man and it's, it's going to kill everything in the sea. And then it says in verse 4, the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and, and fountains of water, and they became blood. And this is God's judgment. Remember, this is God's judgment upon mankind. Mankind has uh, uh, spilt the blood of, of God's people. Literally hundreds of millions of people have died because they believe in Jesus. And, and even during this particular time, because man will not take the mark of the beast, he's going to be beheaded. There will be thousands of people that have accepted Christ after the rapture because of the two witnesses and the 144,000 Jews that become preachers. There can be literally multitudes saved, but there are going to be a lot of those people that are going to be killed because they refuse to... Uh, fall down in worship of the image or to take the mark of the beast. God is not pleased when one of his people is killed. You might uh, remember over here in the church not long back where the guy walked in and killed several people in the Baptist church. Hey, you think God's pleased with that man? No. Anytime one of God's people's blood has been shed by man, 
God's going to take issue with it in due course of time. And so he's saying here, you spilled the blood of my people, and I'm going to make you drink blood. That's all you're going to have. It's, he said he's going to turn the water into blood. And he said, and I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and, ha and shall be because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for, for they are worthy. They're getting what they, you've heard people say, you're getting what you deserve. You've already said that to your own children. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm giving you what you deserve. I've told you, and now you wouldn't listen. Let me tell you, God's not willing that any of these people perish. He proved that at Calvary's cross. He proved that before Calvary's cross when he sent all of the prophets and the uh, priests and different ones that would tell that the Messiah is coming and he's going to die for you and he's going to be buried for you and he's going to raise it, be uh, uh, raised out of the grave for you. And they reject it. And when he came, even, the whole nation of Israel had, had the privilege as a nation who had been given all the oracles of God, they rejected the only begotten Son of God. It is really a, an issue with God when you reject his only begotten Son. Hey, you may reject anything else, but you do not want to reject the Son of the only begotten Son of God. That's his beloved. And he loved him so much that he brought him into this world to pay your hell for you and brought him right back into heaven and said he's going to be the king of the earth. And my friend, you and I that know him know that's really he's worthy to be able to do that and to be that. But we agree with this angel that cried out that he's also worthy to receive all, uh, to pour out all the judgment uh, on these people for what they had done to the saints. You know, in China, literally millions of Christians have died in Russia and the communistic countries. I'm telling you, they're not getting by with that. So, well, those people died. Well, all I can tell you to die is to gain, and I don't want to die that way, but I'm telling you, for the saint of God, we go to be with the Lord. That's where we want to be, isn't it? That's what I sing to my wife. Uh, uh, we're going to walk on streets of gold. And I tell her, you know what? Even if God may lets you and me walk on gravel, it's okay with me as long as we get to be together with God. I don't care. You know, I'm not going to be here. And so we know that. But he's worthy that they be killed. <clears throat> In verse 7, I heard, uh, verse 8 rather, and the fourth angel poured out his vial upon uh, the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God which hath power uh, over these plagues, and they re uh, repented not give him glory I, I can't re I didn't look it up and, and and maybe you know where it is some of you but somewhere it says the sun's going to get uh, ten times hotter and and ten times hotter you would only hope that it was zero degrees <laughs> man it's not going to be fun to be on the planet the, the, those that study that kind of thing show that the, you've seen the shooting stars. Have you ever seen a shooting star? Yeah. They say what happens at the very end when all the energy that's been put in it by the Lord is just about to burn out. It's just suddenly all of a big flash, and that's it. It's gone. That's all the star. That the sun is going to actually, it's already down so low with all that energy that God put in it to make it so bright as we see it, that at the end it's going to just get bright and so hot, you won't find a place to. You remember the guy in, uh, when he said uh, he's in hell and he said uh, send Lazarus that he might put dip the tip of his finger in water and put it on my tongue. Just one little drop of water, you won't have any water. There's not going to be anything for man on this earth. The water's been turned to blood. So what's he going to do? He's going to be scorched. He's going to be wishing he could die, and God's not going to let him die. 
God's going to say, I'm going to make you suffer for what you did to my children when you took their blood. I'm telling you, it is not a good thing for you to stab your sister or brother in the Lord in the back because you're not fooling with them. You're fooling with God. And he does not like that. And I'm glad he don't. I like my father in heaven, don't you? He takes care of you and me if we just let him take care of us. In verse 9, the men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. Can you imagine that? All of this that's happening on this earth, the wrath of God has not brought one man to change his mind and, let, and give God glory. Not one. I'm telling you that because of 9-11, for example, it did not bring men truly to repentance. It put fear in him for a moment, and when everything settled down, he went right back to his evil way. The churches went from 30% attendance to 70, but as soon as everything settled down and their God settled it down, which is government, they went right back out living their own evil ways. They forgot God. I'm telling you, all of the wrath that God pours on will not bring one man to change his mind and believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that it's the goodness of God that bringeth repentance. God has shown nothing but good to us. Man has no reason to turn against God, but he is against God. And so whatever happens on earth is not going to make man give God glory or change his mind and honor God. And verse 10 said, The fifth angel poured out his vial upon, uh, upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Uh, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. See, the sores hadn't gone away yet either. This is on the fifth angel. They still got these things going on and repented not of their deeds. All of the pain. This is Satan's seat. This is the seat of the one that's running the, the world at the time. And all of his cohorts. Every, you know, those that eased in and thought they had it made because they were right next to the one that's in power. Suddenly this wrath of God poured out Nothing but total darkness. I don't like darkness. You know it. I do not like dark. I like light. I, 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 I put night lights. I got two light, night lights in my house. Uh, and if I forget to turn one on, I tell you, I am. I'm worse than a blind man. <laughs> I'm feeling my way through the, the house to get to a light, and most of the time I'm so turned around I go to the wrong direction to get to the switch. <laughs> so I'm telling you, darkness is not good for my part of it, but this is not good. Did you see what it said? They were gnawing their tongues because of the torment, the pain that they're going through, and the sores and everything that's, that's on them. Verse 12 says, The sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the, of the east might be prepared. Now, there's difference of opinion of who the kings of the east, but I believe that the kings of the east is the Chinese, those people that surrounded with China, uh, cannot, because of that, before our modern day when we don't really need to worry about a river to go across it. There's nations also that's been put in place that's helped to keep the eastern kings from coming down and, and bringing any harm to, to Israel. Uh, Euphrates River is a, it's like 1,800 miles long. It's, uh, I forget now how wide. It's just an extremely wide river, uh, about 30 foot deep. You know, but it's one. Can you imagine that? An 
hundred mile river dried up. That's the eastern coast of the, you know, the Mediterranean Sea is the western coast of Israel given land. When, you know, back in Genesis, when God said, you can have this land from here to the Euphrates River. Well, they don't have it to the Euphrates River. They got a little small stretch that's about 30 miles wide or so, not real wide, and 120 miles long, small country. But when they get all of that, they're going to be like about 1,500 miles long and however wide it is from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates. And God's putting all this in place. You see all this going on and say, well, God's angry, yeah, but he also has another purpose behind it all. He promised Israel all that land. He's going to give it to them. It's kind of like when we went to Israel in 1990 and the Palestinian guide that we had uh, professed to know Christ as his Savior when he would come to a part that was talking about where the Palestinians wanted his, he would always say, we know what the Bible says and we know who rightfully, who this land rightly belongs to, don't we? It's not who they think it belongs to. Well, they, a lot of people know that and we know it that God has given it to them. All these things that we've read about that's taking place because God is, has had enough and pouring out his anger on the earth. He's also setting it all up so that when all these nations that come down together to fight him, he's going to get whipped. He's going to whip them. And so when that sixth angel drives, uh, you, was given the power to drive through Euphrates, he, he said in verse... Uh, 13, and I saw three unclean spirits. Now this is kind of a little small break, even though all these things happened real close together, because as you saw, the sores were still on them here in the fifth angel, and the sixth angel comes, and Euphrates dried up. Now we have three evil spirits. That uh, He said, I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now these are the ones that will be under Satan's uh, control, the man of sin or the beast and the false prophet, whoever he might be. Some believe that it, he's the one that leads the, uh, the uh, Arabic nations, uh, religious group. Uh, there's one, I heard a figure the other day, there's 1.5 billion, billion Ar practicing Arabs today, which is one fourth of all the nation world, is Arabic uh, of the Islamic religion, uh, and others believe that this is talking about the uh, Catholic religion, where the Pope has been in charge of all the world nations. We'll find out for sure about this, and uh, it, whenever the Lord brings it to fruition. But it says that these three have evil spirits, and he said, for they are the spirits of devils working uh, miracles which go forth into, uh, into, unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, he said, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he uh, walk naked and they see his shame. This is the end, folks, because here's what he, he's coming up to. And then verse 16, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. As I told you, mentioned the name Megiddo, it's 200 mile stretch. Uh, the Israelites call it the fruit basket of the world. They don't have all of it, but they got the main part of it where they say they could feed the whole world in that little valley because it's so rich. Uh, you know, the soil is so rich. Many battles in the Old Testament and judges is fought on that same area that's called uh, Megiddo. It's only, you can, it's, I think it's a uh, tent. The actual valley is 10 miles wide. Uh, you can actually see the other side. Uh, we was up on Mount Carmel and looking over, and you could see the Israeli uh, Air Force. Their, all their airplanes are underground, and you'd see them come out from under the ground, 
fly out into the sky. It's really neat to sit over there and stand over there and watch that happening over there, all their military back up underground out there. Uh, but that's like about 10 miles over there. I said, boy, it's not very wide. Well, it's, it's wide, and you'll see later that the blood and during the Armageddon time will run to the, up to the bridle of the horse. That's how deep it will be from this war. And uh, it's called Armageddon. And then here's the seventh angel. He poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great uh, voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, see those three little words? It is done. That's it. Now this is the last of God's wrath. Remember where he, when he said that? He, used to, he didn't use the word done, same word. When he was on the cross at Calvary dying, and the last three words he said, it is finished. Meaning that he had accomplished what he had come to do. He died for the sins of all the world. He paid it all at Calvary's cross. Now he's saying the same words in the wrath. I'm, not, I'm through. This is the last of the wrath of God on the planet earth and on mankind in this form. It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake such as was not since, since uh, men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And, and the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the, of the nations fell. And great Babylon uh, came in remembrance before God uh, to give unto her the cup of the of the wine of the of the fierceness of his wrath and every island fled away and the mountains were not found we went to uh, San Marcos Friday to watch uh, Christopher and Justin's football team play and as we were driving I don't know the name of the highway. We'd already gotten off 281 to go over to San Marcos. And I was amazed that we're driving along on this highway and you look down and there's just big, deep uh, valleys down in there, holes. Look like, just like God had taken his hands and put his hand gun and dug a bunch of dirt out and throwed it over on that side. And then we look over on the other side and it's the same way. Those are little things. But the Bible's saying the mountains were removed. Uh, I've, you know, I've not been up on the highest mountain in Colorado. My height was 11,500 feet. That's a little over two miles uh, high, you know. And I'm trying to imagine this all taking place. But when the great flood came, there was no mountains before. And there was a great upheaval. And God did all this during that time where we call the you know some of these deep places that we say well the rivers washed it out God did that you know the, so it's nothing to, for him to cause one earthquake one that's never been like it before or will not be another one like it after that will just do away with the mountains it's going to do away with the islands it's hard to imagine, isn't it? But that's the power of God. And all it takes is a little imagination. If God could speak this planet Earth, 24,000 miles around this Earth, and he could just speak that into existence, what is it to God to cause an earthquake that would just destroy and do away, do away with all the mountains? So that's a powerful God. Yes, and that's a God that's had enough of an earth that's turned against him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But he says to as many as received him, to them gives, he gave power to become sons of God. If you're sitting in this congregation. You have not received Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about being a Baptist. I'm not talking about being baptized. I'm not talking about how many times you've been in a church or what position you've ever held. I'm talking about if you've ever seen yourself as a sinful man or woman, boy or girl, 
in need of a Savior. I'm telling you, this one came to die for your sins and gave himself for you in order that you might be saved. And all he's asking you to do is receive him as personal Savior. Charlie's lesson this morning, very plain and simple. He that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son has not life. Plain language, isn't it? Pretty clear. So I'm asking you to accept him before it's too late. Our last verse says, And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and some says that's 125 pounds. Can you imagine? And it, it, it's all, it says, And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Exceeding great. I can't imagine it. I know people have been killed by hell. Just the kind, maybe this big. That's big <laughs> to me. But 125 pounds? About the size that a man can pick up. Uh, some men. Maybe not me, but you. Pretty good size. Does God love the world? Yes. Is God a wrathful God? Yes. Does God hate sin? Yes. Does God love the sinner? Every one of them. The one thing we have to learn in our life is to love the person and hate their sin. God loves us enough that he paid for our sin at Calvary. As we stand, I ask the song leader and those uh, instrumentalists to come and you trust Jesus right where you are knowing that when you leave this building, no matter what happens, you are going to be with the Lord one day. What page, Brother Joe? 247. The very first verse is your verse. You come as we sing. Mm -hmm.